which is to update the information. So if you were here a lot of, a lot of years ago, some of it is similar, but a lot of it is different. As I go through this, what I want to do is just first tell you about, a little bit about psychology, all right? When I look at psychology, when I look at it from, we used to argue about nature or nurture, okay, and how you get to be who you are. We really don't do that anymore. We came up with an answer for it. And the answer is, my answer, biopsychosocial. What I'll be talking about today is just one little sliver that, that's there, all right? Because you can sit there and say, yeah, but that's not the only reason. And you're absolutely right, that's not the only reason with that. When I look at biopsychosocial, what I see is that how do people get to be who they are, okay? And it's a combination of all of these. It's interactive. You really can't pull them apart in any way. Just real quickly, I'm not going to explain any of this, but the sociology part says that uh, how you get to be who you are, all these different aspects that are there. And you know all about these uh, very easily. You can even look at this and say, how do people learn? Well, these have influences as well. The psychology part is the classical and operant conditioning uh, modeling, which we find has become even more and more important as the years go on about how we got to be who we are. And the last part of there is about developing like life scripts about who we are, our self-perceptions of, our, of ourselves. You can call that the software programming, that that's there. And then the biology part, okay, which in psychology, this is becoming more and more important. Matter of fact, the, uh, the state of Texas just told us now that we are required to teach a biological psych course now which will be a, a required course for all uh, psychology majors that are there. Because psych is, if you took psych 30 years ago or 50 years ago, whatever it was, it was Freud and Jung, and, and what did your mother do to you when you were growing up? Okay, well, it's all changed. If you are a psych major now at a major university, and you're a declared psych major, the first course you have to take is biological psychology. They call it neuroscience right now, but the state is going to say biological. So we're going to teach that in the fall for the first time okay, on campus as an internet uh, course. Uh, but here are all the different aspects that are there about the biology part that's there. I'm not going to talk about all this in terms of learning. I'll just talk about a little bit about neurochemistry, but more about brain structure uh, that's there. I got excited about this many, many years ago. And I thought, wow, this is a brand new field in terms of biology. I was, I was reading about something called uh, uh, epicentric, and some people call it epigenic types of studies, where it talks about how what happens in our culture, what we've learned, okay, could have an effect on how we get to be who we are. Now, what does that mean? It has an effect on uh, brain structure, neurochemistry, hormones, and on and on. What are the first studies I ever read about uh, was done in, uh, in Brooklyn, New York, I, uh, as a, uh, it was uh, done in a, a teaching hospital that was there. And what, we, what they did is that they went into the community and they picked up, they didn't pick up, they, uh, they found <laughs> children who were uh, <laughs> musical prodigies, okay? And that they brought them in at very early ages, like at three and four years old. And they sat them down and they just said, you know, let's start playing music. Let's see what you can do. And then what they did, they separated out these children and they said, all right, looks like you've got some skill. Right from the very beginning, you can sit down and, and play, but you can't. Then they brought in the parents and they said to the parents, you know, your child, this child really has some incredible abilities. And they didn't say who did and who didn't. They just said these children have some incredible abilities. Well, some of the people, remember this is Brooklyn. Okay, that were there, and some of the people said, you know, your son could be just an incredible pianist. He's really going to be a really good pianist. And some of the dads went, what the hell? You know, I want my son to be a pianist. You know, we want him to be a baseball player, football, whatever else. Other parents said, no, oh, that's kind of interesting. I wonder what we can do with this. Some of the parents went ahead and they got uh, additional types of uh, skill building for the children. They signed them up for musical lessons. They started playing music in the, in the classrooms, on and on and on. Other parents went, nah, you don't have to do that. Well, at that time, they first started to develop something called a, I 
I started already. We're going to engage your brain here right? as I talk. But what they did is that they started off talking about, I'll get to this in a second, they started off talking about with the children, but well, what can we do? Let's bring in this new, what's called an MRI, okay? And you know those, you climbed inside of those about your knees. Well, they changed these a little bit around a little bit, and what they did is they developed something called a functional MRI, where they're actually able to go in and look at the brain and see how the brain is functioning. Well, they would bring back these children like on every six months basis just to see what was occurring with the children. And what they found out was that the children who had the additional practice listening to music around in the homes, when they hooked them up to the MRIs, and I'll show you that in a second, what they wound up finding is that there were actually the neurological connections in their brain that's associated with uh, hand coordination, uh, musical listening that was there, where it's actually developing. The little neurons were developing, making more and more connections uh, that are there. But the first time I read that, I went, well, that's, that's incredible. The environment is actually affecting the brain. Because back then, we were talking about the brain cells that you develop at birth, that's it. You're never going to change them. But what we found out, that's just not true. Okay? That's just not true that the connections can, can be made. So the first time I found that, I went, this is great. Let me keep reading more and more about this. And that's what I did. I went off on a sabbatical and did that. I'm an educator, period. My background is, and probably a lot of you don't know this, I actually have an elementary education background. I taught elementary school for uh, one year. I only lasted one year. And, uh, <laughs> I went on and I got uh, my master's in counseling psych, and then I got my PhD in educational psych that's there. So I've, I've always been interested in education okay, and how people learn. And that's how I basically got to this part that's there. And you're probably with me, right? Here's one problem that, that I find, is that most of us, our training is in our academic discipline. Okay? We're historians, or English, or this and that. And we, a lot of us did not get a lot of education in how to educate. We kind of picked it up as we went along. Well, I, I hope as I go through this, I can give you some insights into uh, what the research says about how we learn and how all right, so that's my introduction that's there. What am I going to do today? This is what I'm going to do today. Lesson objectives to identify the salient elements of, of brain-directed learning. These elements will include, I'm going to go through this kind of quickly as I do this. It's brain adaptation, sensitive periods, working memory, reticular activating system, perceptual organization, cognitive disfluence, um, repetitive learning, okay, and on and on and on. All right? So, Think about thinking right now, okay? When I throw this up on here, okay, this particular slide, what is your first reaction? What's your brain's first reaction? And be critical, it's okay. What's your brain's first reaction? Too much. It's too much, right? All right, all right. It's, it's too much. That's exactly right. <laughs> we overwhelm people, but we do that all the time, don't we? This is what we're gonna talk about today. We throw that and the poor students are sitting there going, whoa. There's a little too much here. As I go through this today, I'm going to stop. I'm going to ask you, well, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? Okay? What, are your, what is your brain doing when you see something like this? The other thing you have to remember, if I went through all of those variables, biopsychosocial, how did you get to be who you are? There are hundreds of variables that are there, right? The combinations, thousands of variables that's there. That's what makes us so unique that's there. My son, who's now 30-something years old, okay, when he was 15 or 16, sometimes I would bring him to school with me, and he'd sit listen to my classes. In fact, actually, when we used to have the Child Development Center there, when he was a little guy, he used to come to my classes as well and, and do that. He was always been fascinating with psychology. He's like, ah, psychology is really good. This is really interesting. So I gave him one of my textbooks, and he read about three chapters and said, Dad, this is ridiculous. I said, well, what are you talking about? He said, you guys can't figure out what the answers are. So what's the deal? Freud said this, Jung said this, behaviors said this. Why can't you make up your minds about this? There's something more exact. Okay? And I said, well, that's psychology. That's who we are. When you're in your classroom, I may be giving you specific types of methods and what you can look for. Okay? 
But it may not work for everybody, right? Because all the variables are so different as you sit in a class. And we as classroom managers have to really try to figure out what might be best for the whole class. So it's never exact. My son didn't major in psychology. He majored in computer science, uh, which is exact, and we got answers, and uh, he's doing quite well. All right, so that's not a good one, right? So this is a little easier one, right? You can do this. What I'm going to do is give you theories, but I also want to apply it. Uh, apply teaching techniques that are outlined in lesson objectives. So what, I'm, what I'll do is that I'll give you the theory, and then I want to show you what I'm doing. Okay? And then identify how to utilize brain research and teaching and learning. All right, so these little clickers that, that, that you have. If you turn those over, hopefully none of you are playing with this. Okay? So here's a question for you. An objective for today's lesson is what? See how well you just listened. Apply teaching techniques that are outlined in lesson objectives. Entertain me. Change the world of education. Or identify all of the elements of brain-directed learning. So on your little tablet there, if you think one is the answer, you press one, two, three, or four. Now, if you get all of these questions right as we go through this, Sam said he'll take you to dinner. <laughs> well, actually, you know, I know what a better one is. If you get all the answers correct, Jenny and Sam are going to do your accessibility. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like that one. All right, so. What a promise. All right, so 64% apply teaching techniques that are outlined in lesson objectives. I said that right in the very beginning. I said to identify all the elements of brain directed learning, probably not. So I can't do them all, right? So what this is do, okay? What we're trying to do is engage your brain, right? So if you're constantly asking for feedback, one gives me feedback, I can change or I can correct some different things that are there. Uh, but also, it engages you. You need to pay attention to what's going on. What we know about the brain is, is that repetition, repetition, repetition. Okay? Do things over and over and over again for yourselves. And students respond to that, and your brain works that way as well. All right, student expectations. This is you people, all right? I'm expecting you to focus. If your mind starts drifting away and you start thinking about other things as Sarah's looking at people outside, <laughs> she needs to come back, right? If I see that you're going to start drifting away, okay, I may do something like this, okay, or like this, or clap my hands or something to keep you focused. But it is your responsibility. I mean, I'm the manager of the classroom, but it's also your responsibility to stay with me, okay? I'm not here to entertain you. Okay, this is not a movie for an hour and 20 minutes I'm going to entertain you. You have to stay with me. Now, so an aside, an application, that's got to be up front with students right away. It's your responsibility as well. Too many times it's our responsibility. But it, they've got to focus and they've got to stay. It's our job to keep them engaged. Uh, participate by doing response cards. If you want to take notes, you can. After class, review material. Right? I mean, that's what we all do. That's what they, people should be doing to get that repetitive learning. And then think critically as we go through this, how does this information relate to education or maybe your discipline? That's us. Right? Kind of ugly. But just think about all of that. That's there. Your essence, how you think, how you feel, how you motivated. Okay? What you're going to be doing tonight and on and on is just based in there, at the basis of our consciousness. And our whole life is right in that glob that's there. There's that MRI I was talking about. Okay, you've gone in there to check out your knees and your backs. Okay, what they've done is perfected it and made it a lot smaller. Okay, and this is called a functional MRI. A functional MRI, um, specialized type of uh, system. It measures the hemodynamic response, changes in blood flow related to neural activity in the brain or spinal cord of humans or other animals. It's about neuroimaging that that's there. All right, so let's stop for a second. Now, we, okay, most of you are old enough, okay, that when we see something that may be highlighted like that, we may pay attention to that a little more. may be a little bit important that's there. Uh, to me, though, there may be too many highlights in here. 
because what we're trying to do with the brain is tell the brain to, hey, this is what's important. That's there, right? This can be too overwhelming. When we see something that's blue, it usually means that it's hyperlinked, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what's good for students, though, that's part of their background. They know that they need to pay attention to that. So slides that can be put up here, okay, that may have different colors that they're familiar with, that activates their brain because it's something that is familiar to them, okay, something they can recognize. If I was going to redo this, I'd get rid of, I keep this word in, I keep this one in, and your energy, and I'd get rid of all the rest of the blue, okay, that's, because that would be too much again. And again, the brain does not like to be overwhelmed, right, it just doesn't like to be overwhelmed. All right, so adaptation rules. Now, this could mean uh, that adaptation in our lives rules our life, okay, which it does, because as humans, what we've been trying to do is adapt all of our lives to changing situations, environments, technology, on and on. I also mean by this is what I'm going to give you is some important aspects of adaptation uh, that, that's there. All right. The brain is constantly evolving to meet changing situations. Constantly. Everything that you experience, the brain is going to be changing. Okay? The connections that are there and everything else. The brain goes through blooming and pruning stages based on experience and genetics. Okay? Blooming and pruning stages that are there. So what am I talking about here? Everything that you ever do in your life, okay, and the more you do it, the more the brain is going to bloom, okay, which means the neurological connections that are there, and I'll show you this in a second, the connections are going to get greater and greater, but that's there. If you're trying to learn a certain skill, let's say you want to shoot a basketball, the more you do it over and over and over, if you do it correctly, what happens? The brain actually starts changing and the connections get greater and greater. The myelin that's in between on the nerve endings that, that are there get thicker, that's there, over and over again. If you are a chronic worrier, and we looked into your brain, okay, boy, we're going to see some real connections there, okay, about worrying, because you've done it over and over and over and over and over again, okay? It's like you wear a path in your brain. Uh, the brain is wired to survive. All right, now think about that. We are still animals out in a hostile environment trying to survive. So a lot of things that we do, okay, are gonna be based on your brain saying, is this dangerous? Isn't this dangerous? What do I need to do to survive? And we think we're these logical, rational people. We make all these great logical, rational decisions. But when under stress, there are other parts of your brain that kick in. Okay? Application. Uh, technological interactions have changed brain processing over the years. The current generation will learn differently. Okay, they will absolutely learn differently. Uh, my wonderful mother who died last February, this past February, at 93 years old, when I used to go visit her, she lived in New York at a, at a senior center and everything, I'd go in and sit like eight to 10 hour days with her, just sit there with her. And one of the favorite things those people would love to do, besides bumping into each other with uh, wheelchairs uh, all the time, was uh, watch Turner Broadcasting. The old movies that, that are there. People watch some of those old movies from the 1930s and 40s. That's there. Completely different movies than we have today, aren't they? Mm -hmm. They were very verbal. Okay? There was a lot of language and dialogue. Now, growing up in the 50s and 60s, we had a combination of that, had some of that. To me, watching that was like, oh gosh, you know, when we get to the action, <laughs> what's happening here? This is. But those people's brains were really geared to listening and talking, okay? The MRI, functional MRI is done with those people. When you look at the auditory parts of the brain, which is in here, they have a lot of connections that goes on there. What do we do when we watch movies? We don't have a lot of dialogue in movies. Things are getting blown up and shout and music comes on and everything else. The brains, our brains, my, 
mother's brain, my brain, your brain, and the student's brain, if they're anything under 25, are completely different. They're wired completely different. They're wired for entertainment, okay? They're wired for nonstop stimulation. That, that's there. And we may not do that, but in the classroom, a lot of times we teach the way we were taught. Okay? But the brains may be very different than ours. All right, other methods of teaching are based on our own learning experiences. I didn't realize how light that came up. Sorry about that. That's a neuron that's there, right? It kind of looks like something out of science fiction. All right? Neurons. So let me explain how all this works. This is the building blocks <coughs> of the computer light. So what happens is that there's an electrical message that comes into part of your brain. You bring it in through your senses. Let's say this is the uh, dendrite, or little roots that are there, OK? At the end of the roots, there are these little sacs that are full of chemicals. It comes through here, goes down the dendrite, hits what's called the soma, which is the body, and then goes out through what's called the axon. Now, there are billions of these in your brain, and they are all kind of like this, and this, and this, and this, all over the place. That, that's there, on and on and on. What happens is that as an electrical impulse comes down, what happens, it fires, it releases all these neurochemicals, okay, into the synaptic cleft, which is the, the balance that's there, and then if, if it's right, it's then picked up by uh, the next dendrite, okay? And what happens is that chemicals are released, and boom, it goes through your brain over and over and over again. What I was talking about before is that the more you do something, the more those neurological connections are laid out and are made. The myelin, which is in this area right here, every time you do something over and over again, it gets thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker. That's how the connections are made. It's our job <laughs> to try to make those connections that, that are there for people. The more the connections get made, the better people are going to learn. The better people are going to learn. So that's the fundamental part of that. Now, I could show you a two-minute movie on neurological connections. Okay? There's these wonderful little two-minute neuroscience ones that are there. I put this in here. Uh, because I wanted to say, I don't think I'll show this right now. Okay? The reason why I wouldn't show this right now is because I think I got a feel I got your attention. Okay? Now, sometimes we're told that, you know, the younger generation, they like films and movies and clips. You need to put that stuff in there, which is true. It's true. We do need to do that. But it's also about a feel for a classroom and where they are at the time and the connection that, that, that's there. I won't do this right now, because I think I got your attention. I don't see anybody drifting away just, just yet. Now in 40 minutes, I probably should do it. <laughs> All, right. All right, so another question. See if you're still with me or not, or did you drift off? Adaptation is important because of what? The brain is constantly evolving to meet changing situations. Did I say that? Didn't I say that? The brain goes through a blooming and pruning stages based on experience in genetics. Older age limits neuronal connections. One or two are correct, or five, all of the above. Would you push a letter? Would you put your letter? No. You want another one? Sam? No, no, it's working. Uh, we just pushed the, the middle button on, on, on accident. Yeah, just the, the number that applies to the uh, question. So push one, two, three, four, five, whatever the answer is. Okay. So 88% of you uh, are correct, right? I talked about one and two that's there. I, I, the older I get, I, I'm beginning to believe that three may be correct, too. <laughs> that's not right. Again, what we found, found is that as you get older, you still make new neurological connections that are there. It's all done. All right. So let's talk about repetitive learning, something completely different. Uh, new category, that's the one. What is repetitive learning? Brain cells are in place at birth. As soon as you're at birth, the brain goes through a blooming and pruning stage based on experience and genetics. I said that already, didn't I? Okay. 
Well, once again, okay, the brain likes repetition, okay? As you go through your lessons, what you're going to do is you're going to repeat yourself again, okay? Then what's going to happen when you come back the next class day, then you say, now, the other day, what we talked about was, okay, because repetitive learning is very, very powerful. That's why you're sending children, children send students back home, and you're asking them to review. Again, that's there. Uh, I've never liked the publisher's information with all their adaptive learning that they've done and stuff, because that, that's just too expensive for the students, right? But now since we're being forced to give students free textbooks for $60, okay, what's <laughs> going to happen is that some of these programs are phenomenal. These adaptive learning programs, they're really good. They take you through this process, okay? They, they ask you a question, you get it wrong, they go to another branch that's there, they bring it back again. It's based on a lot of really solid psychological principles uh, on, on brain and, and learning that's there. So I'm figuring if I got that opportunity, I might as well use it with the students that's there. Because that's what we're asking them to do is do more repetition. Uh, the more connections are made in the brain, the better the long-term memory. The more connections that you get. New dendrite connections are made with repetitive learning. Again, again, over and over and over again. Connections get thicker and thicker and tighter. Uh, application is perfect practice makes perfect, right? Now, if somebody's repeating learning over and over and over again and not doing it correctly, well, what's going to happen? You're going to wind up with a false habit. That, that's it. Okay? So we're practicing, we're telling them, correcting them, telling them, correcting them as we go through this. New dendrite connections are made with repetitive learning, true or false? Very good. Now, as I go through this, if you want, if you're not sure about something and you want to turn to the person next to you and say, is that true or not? What, what's, please do that. Because okay? again, what we also know is that social connections are very important. Okay? If you make it a connection with someone else, you say it out loud, the other person hears it, okay? The best way to learn something is to teach it. All right, you've heard that before. All right, let's combine this with something called sensitive periods. This is a long one, but let me, at birth, a person's brain will have almost all the neurons that it will ever have. The brain continues to grow for a few years after a person is born, and by the age of two years old, the brain is about 80% of its adult size. The neurons in the brain also make many new connections after birth. All right, still with me? Okay. From birth to age 10, the connections among brain cells rise rapidly, then decline the remainder of a person's life. <laughs> I want you thinking about something, because we have 15-year-olds and 16-year-olds and 14-year-olds coming on campus, right? Just mm -hmm. put that in the back of your brain for a second. Let me just finish this and I'll get to your question. Okay? <laughs> Easier to learn skills at a younger age, but can be done at a later age, but is more labor-intensive. Application. Patterns of thinking and behavior are brain-wired but can be changed. Practice, practice, practice. It also means, okay, early education. Early childhood education. The earlier you get to people, the better off learning is going to be. If you were a parent who read to your child, okay, who presented at a young age multi-sensory learning, when you read to your child, you hugged them, you kissed them, you said hello to them over and over again, that child's brain is getting wired to learn. If you didn't get that when you were younger, sorry, if you didn't get that while you were younger, then you're going to be delayed. You're falling behind. I don't know who the students are who we're getting coming in at 15 and 16 and 17 and 18. We don't know. I don't know what their backgrounds are or anything like that. We do know, if you look at socioeconomic levels, 
and you look at poverty levels, their brains have not been that well developed. The students we're getting in here, we're going to have to pay, what, a hell of a lot more attention to, okay? If we're going to help them, just for, in terms of brain education, that's there. There's going to be, what would we do, more tutoring? or one-on-one -on -one experiences that, that, that are there for people? Because what the brain science says, if you don't do this, okay, the connections aren't going to be made. I'm not saying you give up on people, but there's just going to be a hell of a lot more work, because all this was done with some children who won the gene pool that's there, who got lucky, who were born to parents, okay, who did all of this, but there are a lot of children who didn't do that. They're going to be delayed. They're going to be behind. Unless we interact. You got a question, Jim? Oh, I can, I can wait to hear your comment. To me, this is really important stuff here. Uh, if you look at all the research on the inability in terms of just food, not getting the right nutrients and food when the children are younger, the brain isn't developing. That's there. It, it seems like this has. Um, uh, this shows itself in some of our classes where we expect a certain level, a, where we expect that since you took a 2,000 level course, you're at a sophomore level, right. but anybody can register for that course as long as they are able to, to, to register. And so uh, it, it, we'll have a mix, uh, we have a mix of students in our classes that aren't prepared for what we're trying to give them, uh, uh, the expectations that we're being asked uh, to give those students right. at a sophomore level. Oh, well, absolutely. And, and then I hope that those expectations are going to be reduced. Yeah. Just to meet, you know, standards for, for, for helping people. It, right, you understand the impact of, uh, of all this in, in our culture and society. Now the kids, the new generation of kids is growing up with iPads and software that speaks back to them. Is that considered nurturing to them or not? Well, the most important thing is interactive learning. It has okay? to be. So if you sit a child in front of a, a TV, that's not interactive. It's no, just but one they way. play games and they well, go to the next level and they go to the next that's level. A lot of that is pretty good. Yeah. A lot of that is pretty good because it's interactive that that's there. Yeah. Um, it's, I just read a study that last week that said that children who spent X amount of time, and I don't remember the amount of time it was, interfacing with uh, iPads and everything, they were delayed in particularly their reading abilities that were there and their speech because they weren't getting the human interaction that, 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 okay. that's there. Yeah, okay? Now, does it help? Yeah, that does help. It does help. It's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. okay. Sorry. You know. Go I ahead. was going to say, I'm trying to stay quiet. Um, so it's socially mediated. So you can't, uh, you can't, like you said, you can't extract any one of those different areas because you will see that delay. We see that. With you see the delay that's there, yeah? yeah. Yeah, I think it's really interesting when you connect the psychology to the microbiome and the quality of food that people are eating, uh, particularly in different socioeconomic areas. And so we're concerned about being able to connect with people who are not getting the nutrients to feed their brains. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how are are they talking about that in psychology? Because it's a uh, it's it's. It's almost like we know what's going to happen based on, you know, the environment and the foods that Oh, absolutely. Eat. In fact, I put that in one of the biology, it was the very bottom of the microbiome. Because that's, a, to me, that, that is really fascinating. Yeah. Because that's gut bacteria. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of studies that ties it to overweight and depression. Exactly. Did you know that there's more serotonin receptor sites in your gut than there is in the brain? Serotonin is, is the uh, neurochemical that they have correlated uh, with uh, a lack of it, with depression. Uh, too much of it makes people who are happy that, that everything, I guess. And the basis of any antidepressant or the new SSRIs is serotonin levels that, that are there. I mean, that's a whole field. Do, do we then treat here to treat depression that's there? But in terms of learning, right, they're not getting any treatments. No, that's being addressed. That's there. It's just so new. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the microbiome, how many, what's that, what's the word, microbiotics or whatever it is that's there, it's, it's, it's more than brain cells. I mean, it's incredible that's there. But you're right. 
Absolutely. And I will add because I'm a dietitian. Ah, and I teach know. nutrition. So and all of this is being addressed in the nutrition field and specifically I I big in the behavioral health nutrition. So this is okay. the huge hot topic of interest is the microbiome and the connections in the brain. So it's kind of coming full circle in all the different areas. So when I, I also was a practicing therapist for about 11 years, and I always tried to find uh, nutritionists, okay, or psychiatrists, there were many of those people, uh, who would treat that way as well. Because you're trying to treat the whole person that that's there. I was just going to say it's very interesting that you're bringing this up because in math, the last 10 years um, in, in my program, um, math kind of has this. Um, we're the cause of everyone not completing. <laughs> For whatever reason, math is, you know, I either have a math brain or I don't have a math brain. And um, I don't know if you all saw, but I'm going to share this with you because it came out this week. It has now been proven with that MRIF, the functional M MRI, that a boy's brain and a girl's brain can equally learn math. Mm -hmm. And so that needs to be Yes, and then the other is the I have a math gene or I don't have a math gene also needs to be dispelled because what we do know, and it's because of the MRIF, is that where we are losing so many students mathematically is in their persistence, in their practice, because math is not a spectator sport. So I have athletes, all the athletes get put in my class, I wonder why. And you know, they'll sit there and they will do 30 minutes of homework in a week. That is not nearly enough for math because we don't learn math unless we do math. And if you're going the STEM pathway, there is no shortcutting it. And that is the biggest problem we're seeing in general is that students that are coming to us, they have a dream to be a doctor or a lawyer or a physician or an engineer or all these things, but they don't have the persistence, the drive to do the math which is building those synapses. Mm -hmm. And so about two years ago, I started teaching my math classes with the beginning of the semester. We talk about, okay guys, how many of you have ever been to a gym? And what do you do when you go to the gym? And we talk about their exercise and their muscles getting strong. And I said, would you ever go once and expect to have results? And they're like, well, of course not. And then I say, well, you have just entered the brain gym. <laughs> and so now my class all semester is about we're going to the gym. And right now, the, the state of Texas, I don't know if you all have realized this, they are forcing us to do prerequisites with college algebra, which means that these students are doing three hours twice a week of intense college algebra. And it is continually building for three hours. So um, the students, by the 